with you. Okay, it's running. And then I'd say we are good to go. Cool. Thanks, Angela, for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I saw some of the some of the recording from last week's kickoff, so I've, I I know a little bit about some of your some of you guys' backgrounds. Um, to introduce myself a little bit and talk a bit about about my background, then um, I'm a systems control engineer uh, by, by by education. Uh, I graduated engineering school uh, here in the city where I live in Brazil in 2004. Um, for a while there, I, um, I, I, I founded a, a startup, a mobile gaming uh, startup, uh, back before the iPhone or Android or any of that. Uh, we, we, we ran it for about three, four, three to four years. Um, after that, I went on to work on a, on a government agency uh, in, in Brazil. I uh, left my hometown to go work there. Uh, my my last uh, my last job there at the government agency was uh, leading a team of data scientists running um, heuristics and and, and uh, machine learning models on um, public data sets to identify uh, possible cases of fraud uh, in public expenditure. Um, at some point in two, around two thousand and Six, I'd say I got involved with the MakerDAO community uh, and started working on along with a, another uh, another uh, Brazilian friend who ended up uh, becoming the CEO and co-founder of Balancer, Fernando Martinelli. I was working with him on uh, stability simulations for DAI, trying to apply control theory to uh, the stability to their stability mechanisms. Uh, that caught the eye of uh, Michael Michael's argument, block science, which ultimately led me uh, led me to being invited to join uh, block science, which I did in two thousand and eight, late two thousand seven, early two thousand eight. Worked at block science until uh, around September, October last year as a research engineer, um, working mostly on uh, developing the development of CAD CAD, not the development per se, but on, on a macro level, acting as a subject matter expert on the development of CAD CAD and with some uh, some research projects for clients. And in September, I got a, a I got a, a proposal to join uh, Balancer, uh, doing a, a bit of data science, a bit of uh, engineering and component design. And so this is this is where I'm at. This is, this is where I'm at now. Um, we're very excited with the the the. the the project with you guys, the collaboration with you guys, and we we hope to we hope to see a lot of what we we expect, and we hope to see a lot of good things come out of this uh, collaboration. We have a lot of things to, a lot of questions to to answer. People ask us a lot of a lot of things that we don't know the answers to because we have never uh, done uh, much rigorous uh, simulation on the on the specific things that we're being asked. So I think the joint collaboration between the communities is going to be very uh, very fruitful and. We, we can we can draw a lot of value from that. Cool. I I suggest that before we move on uh, with the content, maybe you you want to switch on the camera, everyone. We can't have uh, a proper introduction round with everyone today, but it's just I think it will be nice to just see see everybody's face and uh, just <laughs> hi Mark, George. Hello, George from Romania, by the way. China US just woke up. <laughs> Solomon, hi. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Good. Let's go. Cool. So I have a small presentation here to talk a little bit about uh, how to, to help guide the, the, the conversation about Balancer V2. Uh, can I share the screen, Angela? Uh, I yeah. have. Oh, it's locked. Yeah, it's locked. Oh, now I'll turn it to. Do you still do you still see it if I go into presentation mode? Yeah, we see it. Uh, cool. Loading, loading, loading. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is Balancer V two. Uh, knee deep dive, 
not really a deep dive, but hopefully, hopefully something that can get the conversation the conversation started. And uh, I can I'll, I'll try my best to answer uh, to answer everyone's questions, even though I'm not uh, I'm not deep in the weeds in the implementation of the the, the solidity the solidity code. But yeah, so to give a brief uh, overview of what we were looking for uh, when designing Balancer V2, these were the key the key tenants of Balancer V2, right? We see the we see the landscape in in crypto and DeFi in particular uh, moving very fast. So we wanted to build something that was flexible and was able to keep up with the new times uh, as as new demand comes comes up and uh, a, a, traditional Uniswap 50-50 pool becomes obsolete or a Uniswap V2 pool becomes obsolete and then comes a Uniswap V3. The same, in the same way, the balancer, uh, the, the balancer pools from, from V1, uh, you, you, can, you can think of them as becoming obsolete in the sense that there, there's demand for more sophisticated products, which uh, those pools cannot, um, cannot meet. Um, so we and, and, and we wanted to make it so that people wouldn't have to keep constantly migrate their liquidity from one protocol to the to the next, but rather stay within this broader ecosystem of uh, of of, um, of of solutions that is uh, that that makes it easier for you to go from one solution to the other as things uh, as as things uh, start start showing up. So we wanted to enable new forms of AMMs to be built on top of a common, a common base, right? The next thing was capital efficiency. We, uh, we know from the design of, from the, the basic design of, uh, of uh, AMMs, as we said in the, 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 the documents announcing V2 and as uh, Uniswap V3 uh, started pointing in the same direction uh, that a lot of the liquidity, most of the liquidity that is in a pool was never really actually needed uh, for trades to happen against that pool, right? So from the, if you think about the 50-50 the, the Uniswap pool, you have liquidity across the entire space of the, 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 possible, the possible balances. So any price can, any price is possible given those, given, given the, 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 the curve, right? You can, you can have prices from zero to infinity. Um, but in reality, prices tend to stay a lot longer fluctuating around the same point. So you really only need, only need liquidity around that point for the purposes of swapping, right? So how can we make it so that not so much, uh, so much capital is locked up uh, for the purposes of enabling swaps that don't really require all that, all, all that capital? So how can we take that into account? And the third point was gas efficiency. Uh, we saw with uh, with P1 how um, swapping against balancer and providing liquidity on balancer was very uh, uh, gas intensive, and balancer was developed at, uh, at a time when gas prices weren't uh, so much of a so much of a concern. And not so long after balancer launched, the after balancer V1 launched, uh, we saw gas prices go up and basically never come down again. Um, so that started being a, a real a real burden on, on traders uh, to the point where we would uh, see many trades not go through balancer because the swap cost was not uh, the, the swap cost just didn't make it just didn't make it feasible even though the price was better the spot price was better at, at balancer at the balancer pool. So this is what we were going for, and what we landed on was the single vault architecture as a way to, uh, to, to enable that, right? Um, basically, if you think about how things work in Balancer V1, for comparison, you have this, right? Every pool has its own assets. The assets are actually stored in the pool uh, in the sense that ERC-20s are stored in a, in a smart contract, right? You have the, the, the ERC-20 table that, keep, that does the accounting actually contains a record saying that this much die is in pool A. And this much bow is in pool B, and each pool has its own uh, its own logic uh, within it, right? In balancer v1, the pools were uh, um, pools were were all of the same kind. They were all uh, constant weighted product uh, pools, so the logics were, the logic of all the pools were uh, were the same. And what we would have would be 
uh, connectors to those pools that would make changes, would make tweaks to the logic. So for example, a controller of a pool could make a change to the SWAT fee or could make a change to the weights of that pool, right? But it's not an internal property of the pool per se. It's not that the pool itself uh, is, is, is mutating or has more sophisticated logic, but rather it has a constant parameter. It has a parameterized logic and the controller can alter its parameters, right? Um, in balancer v2, what we're going for is a vault that actually holds all the tokens and does the accounting of how many tokens each pool holds. So each pool can have its own logic independent of a controller and communicate with the vault saying, uh, uh, letting the vault know how to update the accounting based on that logic, right? So if I go into the vault and say, I want to swap, um, 10 die on pool X. The vault takes that 10 die and that's pool X. Pool X, here's your, these are your balances. You hold X amount of die, X amount of ETH, and X amount of BAO. And user A wants to give you 10 die. What do you give them? And, and they want to take out BAO. How many BAO do you give them back? And the, the vault does that accounting for, for the pool. Right, takes care of subtracting, deducting the amount of bow and increasing the amount of die uh, of the pool. But the pool can be basically anything. The pool can have a, a, a linear prices, constant prices, uh, constant weighted products, uh, x times y equal k equals k, like Uniswaps. Basically, anything can be built on top of the on top of the vault because the pool is simply communicating with the vault and doesn't it, it holds all the logic and not, none of the none of the balances. This means that, especially for, um, well, I'll get to that later. I want, I want the spoilers because I have another slide on that. Um, so this covers, th this is where, this is the, the sort of the general design, the general architecture that covers the, that, that covers the flexibility point that we were, uh, we were looking for, right? And then what we also get from that is a few other interesting, uh, interesting points that allow us to, 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 to that allows to achieve those three those three main goals that I talked about. So the first them is gas optimization, right? Because you have all the all the all the the assets within the vault, there is no transfer of ERC twenty tokens between the pools. The vault is doing all the accounting, right? It doesn't have to do an external call to another contract meaning the ERC-20 to, to contract to say, transfer X amount of uh, die from pool A to pool B because user is doing a multi-hop swap that requires them to do uh, to, to trade die for ETH in one pool and then ETH for BAO in the other pool and then BAO for uh, red Bitcoin in another pool, for example, right? In V1, this would require transfers from transfers between four addresses, the users and the three, the, the three pools that I mentioned. In V2, there's only two, two token transfers. There is a token transfer going from the user to the vault, and then another token transfer from the vault to the user. The vault does all the accountings of what happens with the balances of those three pools, right? Um, in addition to that, you, we can also have, we also have the concept of internal user balances. So you as, an, as, a, as, a, as the holder of a private key of an EOA, you can have an internal balancer, an internal balance at the vault. Not only does the vault handle all the accounting for all the pools, it also handles the accounting for any user, which means that you don't even have to transfer tokens into and out of the vault if you're keeping it as an internal balance. As an internal balance. So if you have, if you're, if you're a frequent uh, trader um, looking at uh, uh, arbitrage opportunities or just doing 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 trades uh, doing trades by hand every week or something you could keep that as as internal balance and it would be uh, it is just as safe as holding it in 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 a in a in, a, in, a, in an audited smart smart contract like a like a smart wallet or a multi sig um, you have full control over over your uh, over your assets but you don't have to transfer them into and out of the vault which makes the uh, the optimizations uh, even even cheaper. So this is some preliminary uh, data that we have on V2. Uh, V2 hasn't uh, 
we have deployed the smart contracts last week. We are running some tests on the on the on the front end, but we haven't deployed the UI yet. We haven't announced the UI. The UI is coming uh, coming next week. Um, but some of the preliminary data that we have shows this that for a trade, a one one transaction at each each uh, dot in the scatter plot is a transaction, right? And then on the x-axis we have the number of swaps in that transaction. So the number of swaps is how many pools did the transaction uh, go through, or even maybe it went through the same pool twice, um, which is not often, not, not often the case, and how much uh, gas was used by the transaction as a whole, right? So in V1, you can see how this has a great variance, of course, because we have a lot, a lot more variance on the, on, the, on the token front and on things that might be happening uh, sort of simultaneously with the transaction um, at the same time. Even though this is not taking into account transactions uh, done via smart contracts, it's only taking into account transactions done on the exchange on the exchange proxy in V1. So it reduces that uh, risk a little bit. But you can see, see a large variance given the variance of tokens, and you can see how the prices increase. Uh, first, the prices are a lot higher, and how they increase a lot more with every with every swap. Whereas in V2, it stays, uh, it, it, it increases a lot less uh, per swap, right? So the medians that we have for this, for example, the median for gas, units of gas per swap is at around 153 for 153,000 for V1 and around 104,000 for V2. So that's a Question, is, is that a CatCat -cat chart? No, this is a June. This, this is done on June. Something we put, we put on, on June Analytics. I can share the link with you later. Oh, yeah, we have cool. a we have a dashboard. We have a dashboard where we're monitoring this, uh, especially looking into next week. Oh yeah, this would be cool. And uh, am I wrong? Uh, after four swaps, I don't see any gas costs in V two, but I don't think that this can can be the case. No, this is this is probably some fluke on the on the on the data, the zeros here. But maybe uh, I I don't know I don't know exactly what what caused this. I think it's a fluke on Dune, the way that Dune uh, plots uh, plots things. You can see that we only have the we only have one data point for a three swaps uh, transaction, so we don't have a lot here to go to go for, and we don't have any data points on four uh, four swaps transactions yet. We should see some of those start popping up next week. Yeah, I and, see. Uh, oh yeah, makes sense. There are some questions in the chat already, and I just wanted to ask if you, do you have a hard stop? When do you have to leave, Marcus? Uh, I can stay until the end. Uh, can I yeah, I can stay for another one and a half hours. Oh, awesome. Yeah, then brilliant. Then we might take a look at Tana. How do you handle adding more tokens safely? Tana, this is question refers to the world topic or? Yeah, I was just wondering um, the core accounting contract that, that manages all the token balances. How do you, what's, what's the process by which someone say adds another token and how do you manage the differences between tokens? Say, for example, simple examples, the precision or the decimal places. Uh, and I was wondering if you wrap them um, in a uniform interface or something. Good, good question. Yeah, on the vault, we don't do anything. On the vault, we just we simply receive the receive the tokens, and they are stored in the vault as they as 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 native as native tokens in whatever whatever token they are. Where precision starts uh, making a difference is on the logic for the weighted pools. So what we do is every time that a weighted pool registers uh, with the registers a token. So when a weighted pool is created, when one of those pools is created, uh, it queries the, the token for the number of decimals so that it can store a scaling factor for that token, right? So mm. if, you if you think about USDC and red ETH, for example, for example USDC yeah. has six decimals and red ETH 18. Uh, in the vault, they are stored as USDC and as red ETH, no difference. But on the weighted pool that that holds those 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 tokens, ultimately holds those tokens, right? Uh, the the math is done with a scaling factor of twelve on the USDC. So all USDC balances are multiplied by twelve before doing any math on them. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm just trying to think about. Um, Sorry, I said multiplied by 12 and then multiplied by the one 10 to the 12. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then the, so what, but without, 
I, I'm assuming that the actual accounting, you don't need to actually go into the specific token contract. So you're representing them internally. Right. Yes. You don't have to go to do the accounting. You don't have to go into the, 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 the token contract. You're right. Okay. So we represent, we, we represent what we have is we know the balance. We know the balance of that token on the vault, right? We know the total mm -hmm. balance of the token on the vault. We can query that from the token, uh, from the token contract directly, right? And then what the vault has is a mapping for each one of the pools. It has a mapping of the balance of each one of those pool, those tokens in each one of those pools. So every time okay. that the vault, every time that a user wants to trade something with a pool, the vault increments the balance of that token for that pool and decrements the balance of the token that the pool is giving back. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. This is very similar to uh, the VAT and Maker's architecture, I think. Um, if you're familiar, but I think you're probably familiar with that. Uh, um, the VAT. I, I I used to be familiar with the, the, the Maker nomenclature, but that was that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah Taiwanese <laughs> is its own language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions we want to address before moving on? Yeah, Kirti, do you want to jump in? I guess this was a comment. Beep one pool design had some advantages for institutional use. Don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Kirti. Yeah, so so sorry, I was on mute uh, as usual. So <laughs> uh, a quick the, the question is. Um, I think um, V1 and V2 have their own strategic strengths for institutional customers. For example, when you look at the version one, I think it's really, really significant to have this design because um, um, certain regulators prefer to ring fence their specific capital. So, so for example, there's capital reserving, which is required for certain financial instruments. And yet we're looking for liquid at the same time. But having such a structure may help us to kind of give that regulatory certainty um, and i think that also is required possibly so will these both models continue to coexist in just state or will will the the version one be decommissioned uh, and and the version two will completely take over right so the v1 can never be stopped the v1 will live forever because we have no control over the the, the smart contracts in in v1 so there's nothing we can do to stop v1 from 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 staying alive Right. If people want to keep providing liquidity in V1, they will keep providing liquidity in V1. Uh, we do not intend to uh, stop directing trades through V1 on our on our uh, UI. We have no plans for that. But we will be um, migrating liquidity incentivization to V2 because we we know that we know how much liquidity fragmentation hurts uh, hurts users both. Uh, both liquidity providers and traders, liquidity providers end up not getting as much uh, volume as they could, therefore not not as big as uh, not, not as big of an APY, and traders end up not getting the best the best prices because of this fragmentation. So we want to keep fragmentation to a minimum and only where uh, strictly uh, necessary. So if there is a uh, reason for institutional investors to stay within V1, even though I, I must confess I don't I don't exactly follow what what are what what those reasons uh, what those reasons uh, are. Um, mm -hmm. They can they can still stay on V1, and uh, again, one inch much uh, all the aggregators will still be plugged into V1 right. and our own interface as well. Okay, no, just to add another comment, the regulators prefer uh, specific pools or cap pools to have individual asset and liability audits so for example you can't mix two specific pools of capital yet you can provide liquidity using two pools so in such a scenario it requires for you to accounting specific to one specific pool without intermixing assets or the capital does that but to be help at all but to be clear uh the the, the pool still has full control over their assets Right, the, you can you can still even though the assets are it's it's merely it's merely from a logical perspective that the assets are stored in the vault, mm -hmm. but it's 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 um, how do I put this? It's provably under the control of the pool token holders, right? right. Okay. The ownership ownership of the pool is represented by a token, the the BPT, the the balancer pool token. So each pool has its own BPT, which represents ownership of that pool. Right? So if you have 
all the BPT of that pool, then you have full control of that pool. And the only way that you can withdraw the assets from the vault that, that, that correspond to the balance of that pool is by burning that BPT. So no one can touch the balance of the pool if the BPT, if the, if the pool is not designed to be as such. Does that make sense? Okay. Makes and sense. I guess this, oh, okay. And I guess this also answers Mark's question on the cross-pollination between pools. So it's not that it's just because of we have one vault, there will be an ongoing uh, mess. <laughs> but it's, uh, you have this assignment of each token is assigned to a particular pool represented by the BPT. Exactly, yes. Okay. It, it doesn't get, it, it, it's merely from a, like I said, it's merely from a logical perspective. If you think about it, the, the, what are your C20s, right? Your C20s are, uh, and your C20 is a smart contract that has a table saying user X owns Y amount, user Z owns A amount, and so on. It's basically what we're doing is one of those lines, we are breaking it up into several different lines at the vault level, right? Mm -hmm. The year C20 contract is going to say the vault holds a thousand die. And then the vault is going to say, okay, of the thousand die, 10 is on pool A, 20 is on pool B, and 30 is on pool C. And the only way that you can change that table, similarly to the only way that you can change that table on the ERC-20 side is by owning the private key of that line on the, on the, the, the pool side, it's the same thing. The only way that you can change that, modify that table is on, from the pool's perspective. The pool is the only one that can make those changes by informing the vault how to make those changes. Okay. And then we have another question. Joy Dipto, does V2 have more off-chain trades? And that's how gas fees are lower. So two things there. Um, so let's say, let's, let's separate two things then. Uh, balancer V2 on, on its own, like the, the, the balancer protocol on its, on its own does not have off-chain uh, transactions. So that's not why the gas, that's not, that's not where the gas, gas efficiencies I was uh, talking about here come from, but, uh, but the, the gas efficiencies come from the, one, the fact that the vault and the trades were optimized for gas efficiency. So even on a one pool, on a, on a one swap trade, let me go back to that slide, oops. So even in a one swap uh, transaction, so balancer v1, right? Let's think about balancer v1. A one, one swap transaction is only doing one token transfer from the user to the pool and then another token transfer from the pool to the user. Each token transfer costs gas, right? Because you're doing processing on the ERC-20 smart contract. There's processing being done there. So every, for every transfer, there's cost, there's cost. So a single swap on a V1, two, tra two transactions, two transfers, one into the pool, one out of the pool. Multi hops on balancer V1 require you to transfer some asset from your address to the first pool, and then from that pool to the second pool, and from the second to the third, and then from the third back to yours, right? Suppose you're doing a die to Bitcoin that goes uh, die bow one in one pool, then bow ETH in the other pool, and then ETH Bitcoin, and the Bitcoin comes back to you. That's one, two, three, four transfers, right? So it costs more. In Balancer V2, we save those extra transfers because there's no transfer happening from one pool to the next. It's just the vault doing internal accounting. And that internal accounting is much cheaper than external transfers on a different smart contract, right? The external transfers on the ERC-20. That said, uh, you might have seen the announcement uh, early this week or last, last week on the, the Gnosis partnership, which will do off-chain, uh, 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 sort of off-chain transactions. What the Gnosis partnership is going to do is that uh, Gnosis is going to be integrated with Balancer V2 to the point where uh, multiple trades happening at the same time will be settled on Balancer V2, but will be solved off-chain by this, by, by, the, by what, they, what they call solvers. Uh, solvers will find this, um, uh, uh, sort of common interest. So I want to sell uh, DAI for ETH and one of you wants to sell ETH for DAI. We don't have to both go to the pools to do that. The solver does the matching offline, off chain, 
and only sends the settlement to the to the balancer pool, right? Whatever is in excess, whatever can be settled uh, off chain, then goes to the balancer pools and uses the balancer liquidity. Uh, so that will cause even a, it, it, that that will that will change the game significantly because it will make chain it will make many trades virtually free because you're only having you're you're, you're not having to pay for gas costs. You're only paying for the solvers. And the solvers are uh, at, at least in, in the beginning highly incentivized for um, highly incentivized on uh, by, by gnosis uh, to to do the solving. Uh, and later on, it's a different market than the than, than the Ethereum mining uh, transaction mining market, and things will will change uh, will change a lot, and we'll see how it plays out. That's also a pretty exciting set or a dedicated. Uh, I think this would be worth having a dedicated talk. That's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Cool, very cool thing. Um, Joy, did you, does this answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks for that. Okay, cool. And how should how should we call you? I so Imon is, uh, is derivatives is just my Discord name. So I thought I changed to that just to avoid, well, although to avoid confusion, it seems like it's confusing. But um, Imon. Imon. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> just on a side note. Okay, questions are flooding in. Um, two more questions, but I think it's pretty cool that we can dig into it because it, it helps everybody to understand. So Marcus, if you don't mind, um, yeah, let's definitely. take them. Um, Octopus, maybe you just want to uh, say it yourself. I hope my audio is working. Uh, so is the idea that you're you're with the vault, you're able to move things around sort of with in your own bank rather than having to always put them on the truck and deliver them somewhere else? Is that the basic idea or is it something else? It's I, I think it's a it's it's a good analogy. Uh, but another way another way to think about it is um, think about uh, Instead of thinking about the instead of thinking about the truck, just think about the think about having several different accountants working at the working at the, at the same time, and in a multiple uh, in the multiple in the V one multiple strategy, uh, and uh, sorry to go back, each accountant is each one of the ERC twenty smart contracts, right? Each one of those is an accountant, and they 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 only do accounting for the one thing that they are that for the token that they handle. Right, the die token, the die, the die smart contract does accounting for the for the die uh, for the die token and so on. So if each pool is uh, transferring assets to the next, like in V one, then what it what it means is that each pool is telling that account that accountant subtract my balance by X, add X to the balance of the the the, the other pool, and so on. Right. So this communication between the pool and the accountants is expensive, is the expensive part. Because okay. you not only have to pay for the call to an external contract, mm -hmm. which is uh, one, of the, one of the expensive uh, actions in, in, in Ethereum, but also mm -hmm. for all the accounting that that, uh, that particular um, ERC-20 token is doing, which might be something beyond the normal ERC-20, what, what normal ERC-20 tokens do, right? Um, what we have in the vault is that you have one accountant, the vault, taking care of the accounting for all of those uh, for all of those tokens for the pools. So no longer that accountant, the DAI accountant or the that RAP BTC accountant, has to be uh, called or notified that there's transactions happening, because mm -hmm. from their perspective, nothing's changing. Everything is still on the vault. Right, nothing moved from the perspective of the die accountant. Things only moved from the perspective, the perspective of the vault accountant. So you save, in in particular, you save that external call to the to the ERC twenty. That's the biggest, the biggest change. That so transfer events and all that. So instead of having the accountants each in their own separate office and having to send messengers to them, you've put them in the same room, so that they can share each share information. Is that is that more accurate? Okay, yeah, thank you. That's, that's a good analogy. Thank you for that. Then there's David. Solvers are then a yeah, distributed um, order book. Yeah, go. Uh, 
Yeah, basically, I was uh, uh, hoping to understand the, the role of the solvers a little bit better. I've looked this up in the meantime. So to me, it appears um, the one question I have is what I'm actually quoting from the publication by Gnosis. Solvers are encouraged to compete against each other to deliver the best order settlement for traders in exchange for the reward of each batch. Um, what does best mean in this case? How is this determined? Uh, because I think you, you, you mentioned that um, there is heavy incentivization from, uh, from the perspective of Gnosis for the, for the solvers. And that is what triggered kind of my question to ask for how sustainable this is, if this actually depends on heavy uh, incentivization. I would reword my question now and ask um, in terms of best order settlement, how is that determined if there is a large set of solvers and they are actually competing against one another? Good. I'm not entirely familiar with the, 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 the dynamics of the, the solvers uh, on, that, on that level. I would say they have a KPI for uh, best, best execution prices for the, for the, for the traders, for best, the best match. Best match within the within the batch without having to uh, resort to external to, ex to an external resource uh, to external liquidity, but that's just my guess. I'd say at this point, I'm not deep, deep in the weeds with the, the dynamics there. Okay, it's, so you're not aware if I there is like a. a okay, sorry. Uh, I was just wondering if the, there was some sort of a globally defined cost function that we would basically uh, be relying on here. But I'll dig a little bit deeper into this. Thanks. And maybe a good opportunity to invite Gnosis to some of the later calls on on this topic as well, and invite Martin, for example. Yep. Good. Uh, yeah, good. Good. More questions are coming in. Vasily, how off-chain transactions will change arbitrage, the whole arbitrage pro process? So the arbitrage, uh, of course, any arbitrage, uh, every, every, Every arbitrage that happen that can happen on chain will still will still uh, happen, and we'll surely see some some uh, some attempts to front run the solvers uh, transactions from uh, from from uh, MEV extractors. Um, but what it changes, I would say, is that it probably makes it less. It it will probably create and again something to something to simulate and, and and look at the look at the scenarios. But my initial hypothesis would be that it would reduce the frequency of arbitrage opportunities because a lot of the arbitrage opportunities would be uh, would 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 not exist because of the matching done at the solver level, right? So think for example, if I'm if I'm buying Dai on the on the ETH Dai pool and Immediately after that, someone is trying to buy uh, ETH on the ETH DAI pool. In between those two, there's an arbitrage opportunity, right? The price is off sync. The price is probably off sync after I make my purchase. An arbitrager can uh, go to a different resource, uh, a different source of liquidity, and do that arbitrage trade. And then in the then the ETH DAI comes back, comes comes in the, the second the second purchase retail purchase. Uh, kicks in and there's another arbitrage opportunity, right? So potentially there's that scenario. In the solvers mm -hmm. uh, situation, that scenario would not exist because those two transactions, because, because those, two, those two trades are close enough that they would be batched together by the solver and only the, 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 the exceeding amount would be uh, sent on chain. Yeah, so if we will have uh, like two trades, for example, one ETH per 3.5 thousand die, and the, the amounts are exactly the same, there wouldn't be any change of balances in the pool, right? Correct. Oh, exactly. interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool, Jesus, with the next question, what about rebasing? So what about raising tokens that I know that there are some kind of difficulties in that kind of uh, token? So in order to see what was a the limitation about yeah. the we, we chose not to support uh, rebasing tokens. Uh, supporting, v, supporting rebasing tokens would mean an increased cost for, uh, for, for all trades because of the accounting, because of the way that accounting is done on the, on the vault. Uh, basically what, the, what the, vault, uh, the vault requires that a transfer, uh, the, the transfers map exactly to the balance change. So the amount that the, the amount that's transferred is exactly the 
want it to be a map by which the balance is changed. And that's not that's not the case for uh, for rebasing tokens, right? Because your balance can change because of the rebasing. Um, so we, we it, it was it was a difficult decision. We discussed it a lot internally, but ultimately ended up uh, deciding not to support rebasing tokens for that for that reason. We wanted to uh, optimize for gas, and we saw rebasing tokens as uh, as, as something that we could potentially uh, cut out for the moment. Okay. You're muted, Daniel. Yeah, you're muted. Okay. Sorry, I'm muted. What do you think about time? Um, I'm not sure uh, about the content you still haven't been able to show us. Should we continue first with? I don't have a lot of slides left. I can. I think I can go. I, I can. I can finish this, and then we can mm -hmm. uh, yeah. go back to questions. Good. It's, it's not a lot. We covered. We covered much of it. Uh, so. The other uh, the other topic was the well, I think we covered a lot of, a lot of this already is the the fact that we have again customizable uh, AMM logic. Um, so like I said in the previous uh, chart, we can have any you can have any kind of logic in the in in the pools because the vault is always basically asking. Uh, I Brazilians tend to uh, uh, homomorphize uh, things a lot, so <laughs> forgive me if I say the the. The, the the vault the vault is always constantly asking the pool what do you want to do with this right so I'm giving you ten die how much do you how much are you going to give me back how much are you going to give this user back right um, so because of that you can have basically any pool any kind of pool that you can you can think of um, we are uh, we have launched uh, with uh, weighted pools which are uh, limited currently by the by, by the current factory, they are limited to eight token pools, and they have constant weights, constant fees. Uh, they cannot be they cannot be changed. They are basically the same. It's similar to immutable uh, immutable uh, v one pools. You can be the owner of that weighted weighted pool, and then you have the ability to change the fees. And governance uh, has the ability to set um, to set a fee uh, uh, to authorize another account to set the fees of that smart contract, which is what we are doing with Gauntlet for a set of, uh, for a set of pools, the dynamic fees uh, pools by, by Gauntlet. Uh, we're also launching with a specialized version of those weighted pools, which only uh, take in two tokens and uh, have a, a, an Oracle, like, uh, like, like Uniswap uh, V3's Oracle, the, um, uh, what do you call it, geometric mean time weighted average uh, price. We are planning on launching uh, stable pools, uh, like curves, uh, stable pools, curves, uh, which which is a, uh, a curve that's more fitting to um, to tokens that trade not not at parity per se, but at a more constant uh, at a more constant price, like closer to the to, to more constant price. It basically, concentrates liquidity around that point. And we have in the we still have in the pipeline smart pools and LBPs, right? LBPs are a big thing in in, in balancer. We have a lot of uh, a lot of interest coming out of, coming out of that. So uh, that's that's coming that's coming very soon. And then we have the what's probably the biggest the biggest innovation in capital efficiency, which are the asset managers. Uh, so asset managers are uh, specific accounts or smart contracts that are authorized by a pool to manage their token balances, that pool's token balances on their behalf, right? So how this works is that, in, in, I, I simplified a bit before and now it's, it's where I complicate a bit. Uh, the vault, when the vault does the accounting of the pools, it's not only looking at the balance of the pool, but rather that balance is split into what we call the cash balance and the managed balance, right? For a pool that chooses to not have an asset manager, their total balance is always the cash balance, which is what the pool has available at that moment and anyone can trade against that. But if a pool chooses to have an asset manager, it can delegate, it delegates control to that asset manager to withdraw some of its assets from the vault use it somewhere else for something else, 
but the pool continues to do all its math, assuming it has the full balance, right? Because it really, in, in reality, it does to the extent that it can at any point withdraw balance, uh, withdraw the, 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 their, their tokens from the asset manager, right? It has full control over, over that, as long as that asset manager has not put that money to use somewhere where it's, where it's locked up, right? So think about it for, and let me give it an, an example. The, we are working with Aave to launch the first asset manager, which is going to take uh, assets from a pool and land it on Aave, right? Aave has pretty liquid markets. So anytime a pool needs uh, its capital back, it can just withdraw from the asset manager, right? If, the com if, it com if there comes a point where uh, the, the utilization ratio on Aave is so high that you cannot withdraw because all the, land all the landable assets have been borrowed. So in, in case someone's not familiar with, with the way Aave works, basically as a lender, you pool your assets, right? You, you, you deposit your assets in a pool of uh, lendable assets and you start accruing interest on that, even if your asset is not borrowed, right? You have a utilization ratio or a borrowing ratio of that pool of assets and the, 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 the returns, the interest rate paid for the lenders, paid by the borrowers to that pool of lenders uh, depends on that utilization ratio. Higher utilization ratios means uh, higher uh, interest rates because you want to incentivize lenders to pull more assets into the pool. But if the entire pool is borrowed out, then you can't withdraw, right? That's the risk that you're running. That that's the risk of that's the risk of momentarily not having your uh, your capital that you have as a lender. Is that if all the assets are borrowed out, or if more is borrowed out than you have, uh, or if if less is left in the lending pool than you have deposited, then you're uh, you you can withdraw all your all your money back. So the same thing applies for the pool. If the pool if the asset managers deposits the pool's assets into the Aave lending pool and all of that is borrowed, then the pool suddenly can't withdraw from the, from the, the assets, from the, the lending pool. Um, so that's where it's, it starts becoming, uh, uh, where th things are, start taking a more uh, complex, uh, uh, taking more complexity because now you have to carefully design asset managers so as to not let the pools be completely drained out, right? You have to have some cash in the pool so that the pool can do trades because once the cash is depleted, you don't have, you, you don't have, to, you don't have assets to, to, to pay back to the traders. And at any time they have to be able to withdraw from the, from the, lending, uh, from the lending pool. So this is an animation that we had on the, on, the, on the announcement that sort of explains that. Basically the true token pool is this, you have a lot of assets in the pool that are never touched because for all swapping, it only swaps, it only skims the surface, right? Every swapping activity is only requiring some of the assets in the pool. So what we do is we split this in two and we have the cash amount and the invested amount. The invested amount is never touched for most of the time, right? And you have all swapping activity happening here on the cash amount, right? So these are the to this is the total balance of the pool, cash plus invested or managed. What the asset manager does is anytime that the, or is supposed to do, because of course they don't have any asset managers uh, implemented yet, but the design, the, the, the best practice would be for the asset manager to constantly monitor the cash amount so as to know that if the cash amount is running below a certain threshold, they should withdraw some of the invested amount and deposit it back to the pool, right? Deposit it back as cash to the pool so that trades can keep happening as normal, right? So this is again, one area that will uh, require a lot, of, uh, a lot of engineering and simulations and uh, doing requirements gathering and uh, looking at scenarios where what happens if, uh, if the price of a token uh, goes, goes up significantly in little time, then probably you run out of cash amount, right? You run out of cash for the token because if the price of that token is going up, then the pool is selling the token uh, to traders. So 
the cash amount here goes down. So the asset manager needs to keep keep track of that and uh, withdraw from the withdraw from the, the the investment fast enough to avoid the, the 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 pool from running out of cash. Because if the pool runs out of cash, then it cannot be traded against anymore. Right? You have to keep in mind that. The vault does not allow any uh, th does not allow the pool to have a negative balance within the vault. So the cash balance has to always be positive. It cannot the, the pool cannot owe money because oh no I have some money in the manager in, in the asset managers let me borrow some money from the vault. No, the vault won't let you do that. Trades will fail uh, when when you try to uh, to swap against the pool. Same thing for withdrawals, right? Withdrawals too. If someone tries to withdraw a lot of uh, a lot of liquidity from a liquidity pool and the pool does not have enough cash to cover the withdrawal and the the, the money cannot be withdrawn from the from the, the the investment, then that trade will also fail. Again, similarly to how uh, a lender cannot withdraw um, their pools from a lending asset if all of it's borrowed. There um, are a couple of questions about that. Yeah, the let's, let's move to the questions because then I start exploring a little bit of the, 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 the possible research questions. And I think we can. Oh, ah, cool. For later. Yes. So, um, first one is Solomon. I am not sure if this has already been answered. The question is asset managers create arbitrage opportunities. Is it a design feature? Asset managers do create uh, uh, arbitrage opportunities. They uh, they also create uh, opportunities for um, incentivization within the asset manager because, again, all of these arrows here doesn't nothing nothing in this nothing in this neighborhood here happens automatically, right? Everything every single thing in Ethereum has to be triggered by someone, right? So for an asset manager to do this, someone needs to be watching this and trigger a transaction that moves assets from one place to the other. So how do we incentivize? Uh, do we how do we incentivize? How do we make sure that this happens uh, in in the in the needed frequency? Is one of the challenges. Do we make it so that the asset manager is one institution or one person that controls that and has full control over uh, what goes where when, or do we create incentive mechanisms for anyone to trigger the process of uh, replenishing that cash amount? Or withdrawing from the invested amount, um, like like any activity in, in, in the file, like liquidating a CDP, for example, right? Uh, how do we how do we create those? How do we design those mechanisms to make this the more the most the most efficient uh, the most efficient possible? Um, so I'd say asset managers, in its most Basic sort of on on the surface, you wouldn't say that uh, uh, asset managers uh, create arbitrage opportunities. They will create arbitrage opportunities insofar as they are designed to uh, replenish that cash amount, and that replenishment might not leave the pool balanced, right? They might not. They might not do a good job of uh, depositing amounts in the pool, that or they might not have the ability to uh, deposit back pools, deposit assets back into the pool in such a way that it does not create uh, an, an imbalance that would cause an arbitrage opportunity. In that case, it's correct, yeah. All right, and uh, related, next question, what is the, what if the asset manager loses money or the tokens? Good question. Uh, so the other thing, uh, another thing that the asset manager uh, has to do or can do is report its current balance, it, it's current managed balance, right? So think about it like this. The pool holds a thousand die and the asset manager takes out 800. So the current state is 200 cash. Let me write this so that I don't lose, so that I can keep track of what I'm saying. So the pool starts with a thousand die. That's 800 plus 200, 800 in managed and 200 in cash, right? So the pool is doing all its math based on the fact that it has a thousand die. Every time the trade comes in, it updates those th that that it, it updates that thousand die. But an asset manager can be making money or losing money on those eight hundred die that it took out of the pool, right? It doesn't necessarily have to constantly deposit into the cash because maybe the cash is above the threshold, 
right? So it doesn't need to deposit back, but it can report gains and losses, right? If the asset manager reports a gain, say it reports a gain of 10%, the managed balance will go up to 880 and the cash manage, suppose the cash manage, uh, the cash balance uh, stayed at uh, 200. So now the pool has 1,080 die and it will do all its math taking into account the fact that it has 1,080 uh, and 80 die. And that's also a point where it creates arbitrage opportunities because if the cash, uh, if, the, if the asset manager reports that uh, those gains or losses uh, too infrequently, those changes will be significant, right? From one moment to the next, the pools, the, from like in a single transaction, the pools goes from a thousand die to having a thousand and eighty die. And that creates a sudden imbalance in the pool. So how do asset managers, how do we make sure that asset managers report gains or losses in a frequency such that doesn't drain value from, from, from liquidity providers by arbitragers? Does this answer your question, Eamon? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I sort of had a follow-on question, like, can I just take some tokens invest it in some derivative, um, some risky derivative that has an expiration right in the future and it messes up the sort of, so basically you're sitting on some catastrophe of a loss and it's not reported anywhere in the pool. Like, I mean, also am I on, is there anything that keeps keeping me honest? If I'm an asset manager and I'm, uh, you know, I've, maybe I've just taken some tokens and, yeah, invested right. in some ridiculously bad so bad what we what we expect will happen is that asset managers won't really be won't really be people but rather smart contracts right we will know what's what uh, asset managers can and cannot do with the assets that they take out of the pool beforehand and joining a pool that has an asset manager is always a is always a choice so as a as a liquidity provider you decide what risks you're willing to take and what pools you're joining. And you're only joining the pool that has the asset manager that you want to take to, to, to have control over your assets, right? Because that's basically what they're, what, what they're doing. They have control over some of your assets. So you limit how much control you give to them by, uh, by, by choosing one that only, only does what you limit it to do, right? So we don't expect that to be people doing it, but rather smart contracts that are limited in, in, into how much harm they how much harm they can do. And naturally, there will be the the the, the yield farming uh, crazy crazes will will, uh, will will happen, and we'll, we'll see a lot of uh, risky stuff uh, uh, happening within the within the industry. But we don't we don't think that's 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 the kind of thing that will last, right? Okay, and Kirti, your question, I guess, was related somehow. Yeah, it is. Um, I think there's a question below which which emphasizes that in a better way, which talks about uh, lockups. So um, we'll just address that, I guess. Uh, who who is it? Um, so I think it's uh, dot dog. Uh, oh, David. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. So um, it says doesn't ask my measures latency lead to deadlock phenomena. And um, I think it's similar to what I'm asking. I I'm more interested in trying to understand if what are the probabilities of um, uh, a credit default risk possibly because of some sort of a lockup or if mm -hmm. something is not reaching consensus. Um, how, how does that work out in specific scenarios just from risk management perspective? Yeah. David, you wanna, you, you, do you want to add to that before I before I um, no, not really. I, I think we can, well, you go first. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically what we were going for was, the, was with the flexibility, right? We wanted to make it so that asset managers can do basically anything, but we leave it up to users to decide whether or not they want to put their, put their money at risk with that asset manager, right? So because the vault, like I said, because the vault doesn't, doesn't mix up the tokens of a pool, of, of two pools, right? It, it makes no confusion among, between those things. So as a liquidity provider in pool A that 
does not have an asset manager, you run you you run zero zero asset manager risk, right? You're not being exposed to the risk of any asset manager. If a, if a, if a, if there's an asset manager that all it does is uh, land on Aave, then you're and you're happy with that risk, then you go with that pool, and you're certain that you're only running that amount of risk. You can know that for a fact that the only risk you're running is the risk of the Aave smart contracts and the risk of uh, of there not being enough and the risk of the amount available at the lending pool or so the, the not borrowed part of the lending pool not being being less than the than your claim to the pool's assets that's the risk you run because when you want to withdraw you cannot withdraw from the lending pool, right? You want to withdraw from your from the pool, but the pool cannot withdraw from the lending pool, right? So you're basically doing two investments in one, so to, so to speak, because you're not only providing liquidity on balancer, you're also providing liquidity to Aave, right? But then if the asset manager is a risky one that does all sorts of derivatives grace, then you might end up uh, you might you might end up uh, uh, losing money in other in other uh, in other ways, in other uncalculated ways. But again, we expect it all to be uh, open and transparent and everyone be able to make their own decisions as to, as to how to, to invest their assets. Vasily, you referred to a particular aspect on Aave. Do you want to add on that? Uh, no, but I have another question. So do you uh, plan to have something like white list of asset managers that are verified I, I, I don't know, your team auditors that also you trust. So to, to help people navigate, because I think there will be a lot yes. of asset managers probably. Yes, definitely. Everything that you see on the Balancer UI will have been vetted by Balancer Labs. So the Balancer community will vet everything that you see on the Balancer UI. If you see something on the Balancer UI, if you see a pool on the Balancer UI, it's because it has been, it, it will be, it, it would either have, well, again, we are not there yet, but the plan is to have, uh, either only show pools that have been uh, deployed by factories with specific trusted asset managers uh, in them, or uh, show show uh, very um, very specific disclaimers for when that's not the case, right? Like what you see in V1. You know, you might, you guys might have seen when you go to a when you go to a pool in V1 and the pool has a has a a token that has not been vetted. So we don't know how that we don't know anything about that token, right? So technically, uh, the controller of the token can mint an infinite amount, and therefore uh, um, drain the pool from the other valuable token. So we display a warning on that pool saying we don't know this token. We, no we don't know one of these tokens in this pool. Therefore, this pool is in the risk of being uh, totally depleted. Be careful when you add liquidity to it. Do your own research and and, and make your make your own uh, your own, your own decisions but we don't know anything about this. We haven't read it. I expect we to do something, at least something similar like this on the, on the, the, the pools UI um, on V2. Yeah, so, and the same question uh, is related to customizable IMM logic. So for example, in PowerPool, we, we develop in dy dynamic IMM. So uh, what we, need, we should do, we should like make some simulations and cut, cut and prove that it will work properly or we need to like have an audited code for all this weight chaining and all like uh, related stuff and supply to balancer, you will verify it. And after that, you will be able to add this pool. So uh, is there any process for for such things, we don't have anything uh, very well, well well designed yet. Like I said, we're we're in the initial phases of deploying the of, of the designing and, and and implementing the first uh, asset manager is in a, in a partnership with Avi. Um, but what I expect will happen is that it will require uh, uh, audits on the on the asset manager smart contracts because it just has too much power on it. The asset manager is too powerful to to be left unaudited. It has to be. It has to go through uh, thorough, uh, thorough audits, and I'm sure we'll have. Uh, we'll, we'll, everyone will be able to apply for grants, for example. And if the cat, if the, the balancer community finds that uh, there's a new innovative asset manager uh, in 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 place, 
that can that can be useful. I'm sure uh, it will be it, it, they they will they, the balancer community would be uh, would be happy to 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 grant to give grants to subsidize those audit costs. Thank you. Okay, cool. And a final question, Jesus. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have been uh, with your pleasure. I understand that uh, in case you don't have the cash uh, or you have out of a capital in, in like invested, it's like some way protecting your capital from a crash in an asset because in that case, your liquidity is not in the pool. So you are protected from a crash that could move your pool to one asset that is crashing. I don't know if you understand that, but this is like a, some way of a protection because imagine, I don't know, you have two assets and one of them is crashing. So oh, one I part see. of your capital is going to be protected in some way. So mm -hmm. I think it's interesting uh, instrument to protect in some way of, of the crash on one asset. It's only a comment. I don't know if you see uh -huh. it that way or it depends on the asset managers. So it depends in the asset managers to move to the cash. In that case, I probably won't, didn't want to move to, to the to the cash because in some way I would be arbitrage. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the, the uh, I think I think so. Yes, the the asset manager could definitely play a part in that. And uh, like I said, we we made it so that it's flexible enough that the asset manager can do basically anything that the pool lets it do. Uh, so like I said, the current pools don't have asset managers. They 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 do not trust any asset manager. So you, any anything that you put on balancer uh, next week will be. Uh, safely protected. It's the same as a. It's, it's the same as a, a, a V1 pool, right? It has the same, uh, the no, same basic like concepts of V1 pool. What we do, uh, what we what we have talked about is uh, one. Of course, asset managers can play a part, a part in that with everything that's in the invested uh, in, in the invested amount. They can do their own accounting. They can do their own their own logic and uh, withdraw from the the invested amount so as not to run that risk. But the other thing is that, uh, again, going back to the arbitrary AMM pools, you can have pools that have um, circuit breakers that stop trading if the price hits a certain point, for example. So you could implement uh, an arbitrary uh, weighted pool that does trades as long as prices are within a certain range. And that range is controlled by some external uh, smart contract, for example, right? Maybe you have a DAO that sets the price, the price target of uh, of that, that pool, and that pool uh, circuit breaks when the price goes uh, above that above that threshold. You're probably better off looking. Well, it depends, but there are cases where that could be better served by a stable pool, but it could be done in a in a, in a weighted pool too. It would have to be a specific a specific one though, not the ones that we currently have. Okay, but in that case, you can like uh, in case. One price goes to the crash. You can stop. You don't put cash in, and you stop the the pool, and you recover from the capital. Like, yes, can you, you do that? Yes. Yes. yes, for the asset manager could do that. Yeah. You're you're muted. You don't have to to put in cash to recover your your asset in that case. It's only to, to know if it's possible. Uh... So the asset manager, you could, I'm just thinking about this now, but I think you technically, I think you could, uh, you could make an asset manager that uh, stops trading altogether because it doesn't replenish the cash. And then what it does is it lets you uh, withdraw directly via the asset, the asset manager. So yeah. instead of burning your BPT on the vault, and doing a normal withdrawal, what you would do is you burn your BPT on the on the on the on the asset manager. The asset manager only withdraws from the invested amount, the exact amount of cash that you would withdraw, so that you do it all automatically, right? So you okay. don't create an arbitrage of yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Interesting option. And the other thing is uh, the fact that capital is being invested by asset managers. Is it still allows to use as a collateral because in that case, probably uh, yeah, it's more tricky, no, to to have the price as a collateral. Imagine you want to to get the LVP, LVP in other like equity mining. 
you mean you mean for the asset manager to use the the assets from the pool as collateral? No, I, I mean the LVP that uh, is possible to use it. So is there any difference that you? So it's as you know there are other protocols that use LVP as a collateral or some liquidity mining and other things. Uh, I don't know if you, if. if it's going to, to permit to use as a collateral because I don't, don't have have a price of that asset. Of that you LVP. still you, you still have the price, so it's it. You make it, out. it definitely you make, gets it definitely gets trickier from the point of view of the the, the the risk assessment of the protocol that is allowing that to be a collateral, right? Yes. Uh, so the thing, but keep in mind though that each pool has its own BPT. Right, so we're talking about the BPT, the ah, balancer okay, pool, okay, okay. right? The balancer pool token as collateral, but they're not equal. They're not all equal. Each pool has its own. NFT, so yeah. if a protocol accepts BPT, it's accepting BPT under those circumstances. It's BPT of the pool that has the asset manager X. Ah, okay. Yeah, right? So in, in, in their risk analysis, they will have to take that into account. Because in MakerDAO, as you know, there are going to be uh, pools that are yeah. yes as a collateral, and probably yeah, in that case. Probably they will accept, I understand, collaterals of LVPs without as manager. Yes, and, probably yes. Okay. Probably in the beginning, that, that definitely, definitely more likely that that will happen in the in the beginning. Um, as I, again, as as risk as as risk assessment and risk management, risk management, risk management matures, then we'll definitely see uh, also all, all kinds of things moving on to. BPTs and people wanting to take that risk and at a, at a premium, right? Okay. I just wanted to let you know we have 15 minutes left. Some research questions to tap on and still the document with a couple more questions. So let's see. Maybe we start now with research questions, Marcus. Cool. Okay. So uh, I. I thought of a few things, but it's after seeing your uh, your your comments on on Discord and some of the things that we have been thinking about, and one place where I think that could be uh, it, where we, it could be lead to a nice, uh, interesting, and interesting research would be on uh, on the the trade offs for LBPs, right? So LBPs is uh, stands for LBP stands for liquidity bootstrapping pools. A liquidity bootstrapping pool is uh, is a pool where uh, you do an initial token offering through that pool. What you do is you start the pool with say 90% of the token that you're selling and 10% uh, die, for example. And you set the pool to shift those weights over time for uh, during, I don't know, three days. You have three days of the token sale going on. So over the course of three days, those, uh, those weights will shift. And you have, so that you end with 90% uh, die and 10% uh, of the token that you of the token that you had uh, that you started with, uh, this creates selling pressure, a constant selling pressure on the token, right? Because the weights of that token, the, the weight that you talk, that of the token is always going going down, so the pool is always trying to sell uh, some of the token to the to the community, and it provides some interesting properties around <coughs> around price discovery. Uh, like I say here, we had we, we've had more than twenty token launch on 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 on, on the platform. Uh, they have collectively raised more than 200 million dollars and generated a lot of volume on the on the platform. Not only for the the liquidity bootstrapping pool itself, but also what we call side volume, because uh, often people will come in wanting to buy that token, not with the reserve token of the pool, but with something else. And then they, what they would what what they would do is go to do a multi hop swap, like I was uh, telling you guys uh, about before. Um, so with that basic, uh, basic introduction, you can think of all, all sorts of things to, to, to think about and what do you have to do? What, what do I do? How do I start doing uh, an LBP? You have a lot of things to consider, right? What is the starting capital that you, that you put in? What is... Uh, we can't hear you anymore, Marcus. Or is it just me? <clears throat> so, 
So the, what is the reserve token that you use? Do you use USDC? Do you use DAI? What is, uh, what is the duration of the, the, the pool and so on? And what we see happening a lot is that pools come to Balancer, deploy their LBP, do the token sale on Balancer, and most often than not, they leave to provide, to, 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 uh, provide liquidity on something like Uniswap or SuperSwap, right? And it's, uh, it's in some ways, or at least at first pass, understandable because it's, uh, it's the, the, the places most known for, uh, for liquidity. People will usually go to Uniswap and SushiSwap uh, for, uh, for, for trading in, in general. But the question would be, what, under what circumstances does it make more sense to provide liquidity on Balancer to have Balancer be the main place for liquidity after an LBP is done versus on Uniswap, right? And then you have things to consider like impermanent loss. What if you set up an 80-20 uh, pool instead on, on Balancer instead of a 50-50 pool on SushiSwap? What do you expect will happen to your token price in general? And how will uh, the, that, that choice of pool affect uh, the, the capitals of your uh, of your treasury as a project, you're often often being the, the initial liquidity provider with the treasury of the, the, the project and of your community who is the initial uh, who is acting as initial uh, liquidity providers on that uh, on, on that on that pool. How does liquidity mining affect that? Right? What is the amount of liquidity mining that needs to go into those those, those pools to offset? The APY on, uh, on on something like like Uniswap or SushiSwap. Uh, what are the volumes consideration that you have to that, that you have to take into account? How does how will volume play out if you see the initial pool if you see the pool with uh, initial capital on on Balancer versus uh, versus sitting on on, on Uni? Uh, does the mere fact that you're seeding it as a project, you're seeding it on Balancer, is it enough to act as a gravitational pool and draw all volume? all trading volume for your token to balancer. This happens with BAO, for example, right? The BAO token, it, it, it's, it's got a lot more volume on, uh, on, on the balancer exchange than on, than on Uniswap. People know that the best place to buy BAO is on balancer and not on Uniswap. So how would that play out for a token that is launching via an LDP? So I think all of that is, Rich is is is, is a, a a rich place for uh, investigation and looking at uh, doing doing some A/B testing and parameter sweeps on on CADCAD, and it will be fantastic to see something like this uh, come up. And there's a lot of interest for that. Just today, I saw someone on 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 the CADCAD Telegram channel asking for help uh, setting up an LBP. So that was uh, an interesting question. Um, but yeah, every week we have three to five projects coming to us uh, asking about LEPs and wanting to start things. So it would be, it would be very valuable to everyone. I wonder if at some point we could also, so just let's imagine everybody of you is free to choose his or your own research question. So that's a prerequisite and what you feel interested in and also where you can bring your own skills to the table. Uh, of course, it's always exciting to work on a case or a, a particular question that has some relation to reality and uh, that people really care about. And I think liquidity bootstrapping pools are definitely one of the uh, most interesting topics where I could see um, probably not a, a particular uh, project, but maybe we can invite, I don't know, after one and a half months, uh, some of the teams that have been approaching you to gather feedback or to present some first results and to discuss, okay, what, what mm -hmm. are their key interests or what would they love to see? And because I, I would love to have this ongoing conversation with the community outside of this research group, of course, uh, as well. So just to notice. To, to yep, that'd, be, mm -hmm. that'd be great, yeah. Are there more research questions you have in mind? So the other one is something that I uh, I started playing with last year and didn't get enough uh, enough time to, to to work on is uh, I call it connectivity. Uh, it's basically if you think about the if you think about the market, you have uh, AMMs like Balancer and SushiSwap and Uniswap, uh, but you have and if I had more time or more 
more design skills, I would have made this into a graph. When you have retail investors, you have aggregators, you have arbitrage bots, and this is all big, a big network of connected, uh, connected agents, right? Each one of the different, their different policies, their different preferences, and and they're different, uh, and 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 they might or may not, they, they may or may not have edges connecting them to to each other. Uh, so the research question here, and it this is this is probably at least at first more of a data science uh, research question than a CAD CAD simulation research question, but I think it can lead on, lead on to a to a CAD CAD simulation, which is to look at how efficient the market is. I mean, how often do arbitrage opportunities go unarmed in the network? Or how often does it happen that an aggregator um, uh, directs their, their user to Uniswap when the price and balancer would have been uh, better, right? Um, how often does a retail investor that's buying on Uniswap is, uh, is paying more or buying directly on Uniswap via the Uniswap UI versus going through an aggregator and having their trade be split among several different uh, AMFs, right? So I think understanding, understanding that and putting numbers to that, I think would be very valuable to the community and would help a lot of people, uh, people having a better, uh, a better understanding of where we are and how important it is to be well-connected either uh, whether you are a retail trader or an aggregator or an arbitrage bot. And by be well connected, I mean, have a lot of edges connecting you as a retail trader to the, to the aggregators, to the arbitrage bot, to the, the, and to the AMMs directly, but also the quality of those edges, especially uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to aggregators um, connecting to, the, to the, the, the AMMs, because the aggregators need to have a, a, a decent, estimate of what the actual price is going to be for that swap before they do the swap. And same for the arbitrage bots, right? I mean, if an arbitrage bot is assuming, let's take this for example. For an example. Uh, suppose an arbitrage bot, someone simply switches their arbitrage bot from Uniswap, from Balancer V1 to Uniswap to Balancer V2, right? One of the key components of an arbitrage bot is your cost. How much will our transaction cost? And costs are going down significantly in Balancer V2. So if you don't change that parameter in your, in your arbitrage bot, your arbitrage bot is not going to work as frequently as it should in Balancer V2. So that's what I mean by the quality of the edge connecting those two uh, those those two uh, uh, nodes. Uh, you have to, and again, that would something that would could be answered by uh, by, a, by a research question like this, right? I generally uh, put it all in the bucket of how efficient is the market. Because I think it 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 basically collapses all of those those questions into one, uh, but it's it can be split into, into into several different ones, and where it would lead to a to to uh, what I think would be a, a, a an interesting cat cat simulation would be uh, we encode those policies into uh, a cat cat simulation as they were, and then we tweak them to say what would have happened if those edges were a bit different. Right? If they or or if or even if if edges if if edges had existed, right? And ex suppose this edge existed. We notice we, we know from the data that this edge didn't exist. Suppose it did. What would have happened? What? How would things have played out? A question to observe this entire space. Yeah. And the other one is on uh, dynamic swap fees. Uh, I think this is something that generates uh, a lot of interest. There's a lot of, uh, th there have been, there've been quite a few papers uh, on this. Conflict has published some. Uh, I, if, if you guys saw, if, if one of you guys, some of you saw the, the presentation that I did on um, in Osaka in, at, at the DevCon uh, in 20, when was that? 2019, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I talk a little bit about that and how we simulated what would have happened uh, with with Uniswap if the fees had been if the fees had been different. So this led us to explore this uh, possibility with conflict of the dynamic uh, the dynamic uh, fee setting, where they have their own models. Conflict has their own models, and they will be setting the fees of a set of pools uh, based on 
what that model tells them to do so as to maximize the returns for, uh, for liquidity providers. But I would be really interested in seeing something like this play out in the open. Uh, a research question, some, something like this being developed by the community and owned by the community uh, would, would, would be very interesting because uh, the one, the balancer community can, uh, can, can set the fees and, and will set the fees, the, the, can set the fees setting, can parameterize the pools to say who is the fee setting, uh, the, the fee setting account, and it's setting them to Gauntlet. But anyone can deploy a pool and be the owner of that pool and therefore have the right to set the swap fees on that pool, right? So if someone was to come up with a, a, an efficient model for, uh, for, for fee, swap fee setting, uh, they could deploy their own pool and drive liquidity to it uh, by, by, by optimizing those returns. All right. Any more questions? Any more research questions? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Marcus, <laughs> for taking the time and uh, taking us on this journey uh, to V2 and also proposing first research questions. Um, I think we've touched on a couple of the questions that have been included in the document, in the question document. Thanks everyone for posting your questions and um, well, doing your own research on V2. I think we will touch on it over and over again across the entire research group duration. And I think, Marcus, we should also see how we can make next steps then picking up research questions, uh, gathering feedback from your side. And I think this will all come together quite, mm -hmm. quite nicely. So for the moment, I only want to add two announcements. Um, A is um, overall research questions. So feel free to explore the space at the moment. You are not under pressure to choose your research question immediately. We will have roughly another two weeks to explore, to discuss. Uh, there'll be Vasily uh, introducing some more research questions, probably related to what you've presented, Marcus, and then also with building on the new opportunities with V2. So we will have a dedicated session on that too. And we are in touch with Ocean, um, who love to see token spy simulations, agent-based simulations on V2. And Trent will be in one of our sessions introducing his point of view and his most, um, well, his proposals on most relevant research questions from their side. So there will be a variety. And again, as mentioned, uh, our aim is to not only have you guys doing research and exploration on these topics and also that we train each other in running simulations we also want to have these touch points with the with tool providers with asset managers potentially with um, startups looking for liquidity bootstrapping um, and what ever is relevant to also provide feedback on okay how does this how does this token engineering work really can help the outside world in the, the overall DeFi space so i'll i'll um, provide all dates on these sessions in the next days um, i hope you all have the link to the one-stop shop let me share it again in this channel as well so that we make sure you're all have access to the schedule and our next session will be on Tuesday. I think it's 6 p.m. Please check the schedule again. Uh, 6 p.m. Central European, two hours. And we will introduce what we have been doing on V1 so far and take a closer look to CatCat. Capabilities of CatCat, how we use CatCat, and then hopefully we can build on that for all the V2 simulations as well. And um, Nico is currently working on the Python implementation of the V2 math. Hi, Nico. <laughs> okay, this is the Hello. program of next Tuesday. Stay tuned. See you next week. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you, Marcus. And yeah, looking forward.
Thanks, everyone. Yeah, looking forward to the next uh, to the next steps. If anyone has other questions, feel free to feel free to feel free to mention me on on, on Discord, and I'll get a notification mm -hmm. and get back to your questions. As awesome. Next. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Obrigado. Bye.